Welcome to Nietzsche over binaural beats, presented to you from Phenomenology Club. Are the binaural beats too loud? Are they too binaural? Somebody, please. If my voice competes with the binaural beats, then the binaural beats must lessen in volume. <laughs> One second. What about that? How's this? Is that better? Is my voice competing with the binaural beats? Binaural beats. You will be the Ubermensch. You are the Uberman. You're so fucking cool. I'm over it like the Ubermensch. <laughs> Get it? Is it too loud? I'm gonna be reading like this. I'm gonna be reading sexy, sexy and seductive. Is my voice competing with the binaural beats? You are a god. You have the will to power. What about now? <laughs> You are a god. Your dick is massive. I have the will to power. You are Jesus. You are the Ubermensch. Your dick is fucking massive. What's too loud? My voice or the beats? God damn it. Your dick is huge. My dick is also huge. Your dick will be the biggest dick ever. My dick is massive. My dick is ginormous. Our dicks are giant. Can you hear my voice or not? It's time to read, you motherfuckers. How is it? How's the volume? Am I competing with the binaural beats? I could turn it down a little bit. What about now? <laughs> my dick is massive. My dick is huge. My dick is the biggest dick in all of Germany. My dick is huge. My dick is huge. Your dick is huge. You are a god. You do all your reading assignments for book club. You drink only the finest tap water from the top of the motherfucking Andes. Okay, you're telling me it's good. If there's a problem, just tell me. I'm sitting by a window because these readings usually take a little bit. So I'm not up in front of my computer. Um, but just leave some comments. I'm going to be reading to us these selected excerpts from Nietzsche's 
work, which is really a collection of Nietzsche's, uh, of various Nietzsche writings compiled together called The Will to Power. We are reading the Walter Kaufman translation. If you would like to read along, please navigate right now to www.phenomenology.club and under the speed reading site section, you will find a link to the PDF. I am about to read aloud to you. We are meeting Sunday to discuss this text in our club discord. I do these readings out loud sometimes for those of us in the club that can't read or are too lazy to read, which is quite a few of you, bitches. For those of you who don't know, Nietzsche liked music a lot. He particularly liked his good friend's music, (laughs) Richard Wagner. I tried to find some appropriate Wagner to put under this, and it was all too cacophonous and exciting, and we don't want to get too excited. We want to sit and meditate and do our reading. Nietzsche also liked Chopin. Chopin! (laughs) tried to find some of that. I hate Chopin. So fuck that. So you know what I did? I typed Nietzsche binaural beats into YouTube and the first thing that came up was this. Uh. Destroy unconscious blockages and negativity. 396 hertz. So it was the first result. Basically, if we listen to these 396 hertz, we will become the ubermensch. So, everybody get a pillow, do some stretching. We've been doing yoga in Phenomenology Club. I find this very relaxing and absurd and funny. I hope you have fun as I sit by the window, smoking cigarettes, reading this text by Nietzsche. Hold on. Hey. Everyone get your pillow and your stretchy pants. We're about to begin. For those of you reading along, this begins on page 290 in the PDF. In the printed text, it's 261. But if you're looking at the PDF, just go to page 290. Adam says, don't binaural beats only work with headphones? Well, Adam, binaural beats actually don't work at all because binaural beats are actually a bunch of bullshit. So really, it doesn't matter if you're wearing headphones or not, as long as you're here with us, having a good old motherfucking time, getting this fucking wisdom. And those of you who are interested in this text, I hope that you please sign up for $1.00 on the Patreon and come to our book club meeting on Sunday where we will be discussing this text together, The Will to Power. I selected these texts, this text specifically, specifically for its relevance to phenomenology. Our next reading in book club will be Husserl. Specifically, I chose this text because the, the writing uh, has much to do with Nietzsche's perspectivism. Nietzsche, as some of you may know, is basically regarded the forefather of postmodernism because of his ideas specifically on perspective and perspectivism what we call it are us students of philosophy but anyway I'm gonna not talk I made a promise to myself to not speak to myself during this reading because I have a really bad habit of getting excited and highlighting and reading again and all this shit I will not speak during this reading I will stay in character and give you this raw, unfiltered, uncut Nietzsche. Hold on, I'm trying to zoom in. God damn it! Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Please. I can't zoom in, fuck. Hold on, one sec. Well, now you have a few minutes. Get your 
Get your stretchy pants on. I'm pulling up the PDF, sorry. Get your stretchy pants, get your pillow. Take your acid now. Take that acid now. Right now. Fucking PDFs. I'm on my phone for once. I'm never on my phone. My printer's been giving me troubles. <coughs> One more second, I'm sorry. Your dick is huge. Your dick is large. Your dick is ginormous. You are Nietzsche. I am Nietzsche. We are Nietzsche. We are a god. I am a god. And what do gods do? Your dick is gigantic. What the fuck is the downloads folder? Your dick is fucking ginormous. You are God. Oh my god, this is killing me. Okay, one sec. Give me literally 30 more seconds. I'm just gonna read it tiny because I can't stand this shit anymore. tiny <laughs> lighting my cigarette <sighs> everybody's stretching I'm pulling up the page here we go 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 <laughs> almost there to power. This is from the section titled, The Will to Power as Knowledge, Part 1, Method of Inquiry. It is not the victory of science that distinguishes our 19th century, but the victory of scientific method over science. History of scientific method, considered by Augusta Comte as virtually philosophy itself. The great methodologists, Aristotle, Bacon, Descartes, Augusta Comte. The most valuable insights are arrived at last, but the most valuable insights are methods. All the methods, all the presuppositions of our contemporary science were for millennia regarded with the profoundest contempt. On their account, one was excluded from the society of respectable people. One was considered as an enemy of God, as a reviler of the highest ideal, as possessed. We have had the whole pathos of mankind against us, our conception of what truth should be, what service of truth should be, our objectivity, our method, our silent, cautious, mistrustful ways were considered perfectly contemptible. At bottom, it has been an aesthetic taste that has hindered mankind most. It believed in the picturesque effect of truth. It demanded of the man of knowledge that he should produce a powerful effect 
on the imagination. This looks as if an antithesis has been achieved, a leap made. In reality, the schooling through moral hyperbole prepared the way step by step for that milder of pathos that became incarnate in the scientific character. The consciousness in small things, the self-control of the religious man, were a preparatory school for the scientific character. Above all, the disposition that takes problems seriously, regardless of the personal consequences. Section 2. Well, subsection 2. The epistemological starting point. Profound aversion to reposing once and for all in any one total view of the world, fascination of the opposing point of view, refusal to be deprived of the stimulus of the enigmatic. The presupposition that things are, at bottom, ordered so morally that human reason must be justified, is an ingenious presupposition and a piece of naivety the after-effect of belief in God's veracity. God understood as the creator of things. These concepts an inheritance from a former existence in a beyond. Contradiction of the alleged facts of consciousness. Observation is a thousand times more difficult. Error perhaps a condition of observation in general. The intellect cannot criticize itself, simply because it cannot be compared with other species of intellect and because its capacity to know would be revealed only in the presence of true reality, i.e., because in order to criticize the intellect, we should have to be a higher being with absolute knowledge. This presupposes that Distinct from every perspective, kind of outlook, or sensual spiritual appropriation, something exists, an in itself. But the psychological derivation of the belief in things forbids us to speak of things in themselves. That a sort of adequate relationship subsists between subject and object. That the object is something that, it's see that if seen from within would be a subject. Is a well-meant invention which, I think, has had its day. The measure of that of which we are in any way con conscious sorry, is totally dependent upon the coarse utility of its becoming conscious. How could this nook perspective of consciousness permit us to assert anything of subject and object that touched reality? Pacha. Critique. Sorry, I'm reading so tiny. Critique of modern philosophy. Erroneous starting point. As if there existed facts of consciousness and no phenomenalism in introspection. Consciousness, to what extent the idea of an idea, the idea of will, the idea of a feeling known to ourselves alone, are totally superficial. Our inner world, too, appearance. I maintain the phenomenality of the inner world, too, Everything of which we become conscious is arranged, simplified, <laughs> schematized, interpreted through and through. The actual process of inner perception, the causal connection between thoughts, feelings, desires, between subject and object are absolutely hidden from us and are perhaps purely imaginary. The apparent inner world is governed by just the same forms and procedures as the outer world. We never encounter facts, 
pleasure and displeasure are subsequent and derivative intellectual phenomena. Causality eludes us. To suppose a direct causal link between thoughts as logic does, that is the consequence of the crudest and clumsiest observation. Between two thoughts, all kinds of affects play their game, but their motions are too fast. Therefore, we fail to recognize them. We deny them. Thinking, as epistemologists conceive it, simply does not occur. It is a quite arbitrary fiction, arrived at by selecting one element from the process and eliminating all the rest, an artificial arrangement for the purpose of intelligibility. The spirit, something that thinks, where possible, even absolute, pure spirit. Shout out, Hegel. This conception is a second derivative of that false introspection which believes in thinking. First, an act is imagined, which simply does not occur, thinking. And secondly, a subject substratum in which every act of thinking and nothing else has its origin. That is to say, both the deed and the doer are fictions. Wah, 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 wah. One must not look for phenomenalism in the wrong place. Nothing is more phenomenal, or more clearly, nothing is so much deception as this inner world which we observe with the famous inner sense. We have believed in the will as cause to such an extent that we have from our own personal experience introduced a cause into events in general, i.e. intention, a cause of events. We believe that thoughts as they succeed one another in our minds stand in some kind of causal relation, the logician especially, who actually speaks of nothing but instances which never occur in reality has grown accustomed to the prejudice that thoughts cause thoughts. <laughs> I just got goosebumps. We believe, and even our philosophers still believe, that pleasure and pain are causes of reactions, that the purpose of pleasure and pain is to occasion reactions. For millennia, Pleasure and the avoidance of displeasure have been flatly asserted as the motives for every action. Upon reflection, however, we should concede that everything would have taken the same course, according to exactly the same sequence of causes and effects, if these states, pleasure and displeasure, had been absent, and that one is simply deceiving oneself if one thinks they cause anything at all. They are epiphenomena, with a quite different object than to evoke reactions. They are themselves effects within the instituted process of reaction. Oh my god. In summa, everything of which we become conscious is a terminal phenomena, an end, and causes nothing. Every successive phenomena in consciousness is completely atomistic, and we have sought to understand the world through the reverse conception, as if nothing were real and effective but thinking, feeling, willing. The phenomenalism of the inner world, chronological inversion, so that the cause enters consciousness later than the effect. We have learned that pain is projected to a part of the body without being situated there. We have learned that sense impressions naively supposed to be conditioned by the outer world are, on the contrary, conditioned by the inner world, that we are always unconscious of the real activity of the outer world. The fragment of outer world of which we are conscious is born after an effect from outside has impressed itself upon us and is subsequently projected as its cause. 
In the phenomenalism of the inner world, we invert the chronological order of cause and effect. The fundamental fact of inner experience is that the cause is imagined after the effect has taken place. The same applies to the succession of thoughts. We seek the reason for a thought before we are conscious of it, and the reason enters consciousness first and then its consequence. Our entire dream life is the interpretation of complex feelings with a view to possible causes, and in such way that we are conscious of a condition only when the supposed causal chain associated with it has entered consciousness. The whole of inner experience rests upon the fact that a cause for an excitement of the nerve centers is of the nerve centers is sought and imagined, and that only a cause thus discovered enters consciousness. This cause in no way corresponds to the real cause. It is a groping on the basis of previous inner experiences, i.e., of memory. But memory also maintains the habit of the old interpretations, i.e. of erroneous causality, so that the inner experience has to contain within it the consequences of all previous false causal fictions. Our outer world as we project it every moment is indis indissolubly, <laughs> indissolubly tied to the old error of the ground. We interpret it by means of the schematism of things, etc. Inner experience enters our consciousness only after it has found a language the individual understands, i.e. a translation of a condition into conditions familiar to him. To understand means merely to be able to express something new in the language of something old and familiar, e.g., I feel unwell. Such a judgment presupposes a great and late neutrality of the observer. The simple man always says, this or that makes me feel unwell. He makes up his mind about his feeling unwell only when he has seen a reason for feeling unwell. I call that a lack of philology. To be able to read off a text as a text without interposing an interpretation is the less developed form of inner experience, perhaps one that is hardly possible. There exists neither spirit, nor reason, nor thinking, nor consciousness, nor soul, nor will, nor truth. All are fictions that are of no use. Damn. There is no question of subject and object, but of a particular species of animal that can prosper only through a certain relative rightness. Above all, regularity of its perceptions so that it can accumulate experience. Knowledge works as a tool of power. Hence, it is plain that it increases with every increase of power. The meaning of knowledge here, as in the case of good or beautiful, the concept is to be regarded in a strict and narrow anthropocentric and biological sense. In order for a particular species to maintain itself and increase its power, its conception of reality must comprehend enough of the calculable and constant for it to have a scheme of behavior on it. The utility of preservation not some abstract theoretical need not to be deceived, stands as the motive behind the development of the organs of knowledge. They develop in such a way that their observations suffice for our preservation. In other words, the measure of the desire for knowledge 
depends upon the measure to which the will to power grows in a species. A species grasps a certain amount of reality in order to become master of it. In order to press it into service. Oh, I just got goosebumps again. Friedrich! Friedrich! God damn it, Friedrich. Hold on, I have to light another cigarette. I'm getting excited. <clears throat> Part 3 Belief in the ego, the subject Against positivism, which halts at phenomena, there are only facts, in quotations. I would say, no. Facts is precisely what there is not, only interpretation. We cannot establish any fact in itself. Perhaps it is folly to want to do such a thing. Everything is subjective, you say, but even this is interpretation. The subject is not something given, it is something added and invented and projected behind what there is. Finally, is it necessary to posit an interpreter behind the interpretation? Even this is invention, hypothesis. Insofar as the word knowledge has any meaning, the world is knowable, but it is interpretable otherwise. It has no meaning behind it, but countless meanings. Perspectivism. It is our needs that interpret the world, our drives, and their for and against. Every drive is a kind of lust to rule. Each one has its perspective that it would like to compel all the other drives to accept as a norm. We set up a word at the point at which our ignorance begins, at which we can see no further, e.g. the word I, the word do, the word suffer. These are perhaps the horizon of our knowledge, but not truths. Through thought, the ego is posited, but hitherto one believed, as ordinary people do, that in I think, quote unquote, there was something of immediate certainty, and that this I was the given cause of thought, from which by analogy we understood all other causal relationships. However, habitual and indispensable this fiction, oops, sorry, However habitual and indispensable this fiction may have become by now, that in itself proves nothing against its imaginary origin, a belief can be a condition of life and nonetheless be false. There is thinking, therefore there is something that thinks. This is the upshot of all Descartes' argumentation. But that means positing as true a priori, our belief in the concept of substance, that when there is thought there has to be something that thinks, is simply a formulation of our grammatical custom that adds a doer to every deed. In short, this is not merely the substantiation of a fact, but a logical metaphysical postulate. Along the lines followed by Descartes, one does not come upon something absolutely certain, but only upon the fact of a very strong belief. If one reduces the, prep the proposition to, there is thinking, therefore there are thoughts, one has produced a mere tautology. And precisely that which is in question, the reality of thought, is not touched upon. 
That is, in this form, the apparent reality of thought cannot be denied. But what Descartes desired was that thought should have not an apparent reality, but a reality in itself. The concept of substance is a consequence of the concept of the subject, not the reverse. If we relinquish the soul, the subject, the precondition for substance in general disappears. One acquires degrees of being, one loses that which has being. Critique of reality. Where does the more or less real, the gradation of being in which we believe, lead to? The degree to which we feel life and power, logic and coherence of experience, gives us our measure of being reality, not appearance. The subject. This is the term for our belief in a unity underlying all the different impulses of the highest feeling of reality. We understand this belief as the effect of one cause. We believe so firmly in our belief that for its sake we imagine truth, reality, substantiality in general. The subject is the fiction that many similar states to states in us are the effect of our substratum. But it is we who first created the similarity of these states. Our adjusting them and making them similar is the fact, not their similarity, which ought rather to be denied. A fucking men. Amen, bitch the fuck. One would have to know what being is in order to decide whether this or that is real, e.g. the facts of consciousness, in the same way. What certainty is, what knowledge is, and the like. But since we do not know this, a critique of the faculty of knowledge is senseless. How should a tool be able to criticize itself when it can use only itself for the critique? It cannot even define itself. Must all philosophy not ultimately bring to light the preconditions upon which the process of reason depends? Our belief is the ego as a substance, as the sole reality from which we ascribe reality to things in general? The oldest realism at last comes to light. At the same time, the entire religious history of mankind is recognized as the history of the soul superstition. Here we come to a limit. Our thinking itself involves this belief, with its distinction of substance, accident, deed, doer, etc. To let it go means being no longer able to think. <laughs> but that a belief, however necessary it may be for the preservation of a species, has nothing to do with truth. One knows from the fact that E.g., we have to believe in time, space, and motion without feeling compelled to grant them absolute reality. Psychological derivation of our belief in reason. The concept reality, being, is taken from our feeling of the subject. The subject interpreted from within ourselves so that the ego counts as a substance, as the cause of all deeds, as a doer. The logical metaphysical postulates, the belief in substance, accident, attribute, etc., derive their convincing form from our habit of regarding all our deeds as consequences of our will, so that the ego as substance does not vanish in the multiplicity of change, but there is no such thing as will. We have no categories at all that permit us to distinguish a world in itself from a world of appearance. 
all our categories of reason are of sensual origin derived from the empirical world. The soul, the ego, the history of these concepts shows that here too, the oldest distinction, breath, life. If there is nothing material, there is also nothing immaterial. The concept no longer contains anything. No subject atoms. The sphere of a subject constantly growing or decreasing. The center of the system constantly shifting. In cases where it cannot organize the appropriate mass, it breaks into two parts. On the other hand, it can transform a weaker subject into its functionary without destroying it. And to a certain degree form a new unity with it. No substance, rather something that in itself strives after greater strength and that wants to preserve itself only indirectly. It wants to surpass itself. The will to power. Everything that enters consciousness as unity is already tremendously complex. We always have only a semblance of unity. The phenomenon of the body is the richer, clearer, more tangible phenomenon to be discussed first methodologically without coming to any decision about its ultimate significance. The assumption of one single subject is perhaps unnecessary. Perhaps it is just as permissible to assume a multiplicity of subjects whose interaction and struggle is the basis of our thought and our consciousness in general. A kind of aristocracy, aristocracy of cells in which dominion resides? To be sure, an aristocracy of equals used to ruling jointly and understanding how to command? My hypotheses. The subject as multiplicity. Shout out Leibniz. Pain intellectual and dependent upon the judgment, harmful, projected. The effect always unconscious. The inferred and imagined cause is projected, follows in time. Pleasure is a kind of pain. The only force that exists is of the same kind as that of the will, a commanding of other subjects, which thereupon change. The continual transitoriness and fleetingness of the subject, mortal soul, number as perspective form. Belief in the body is more fundamental than belief in the soul. The latter arose from unscientific reflection on the agonies of the body, something that leaves it, belief in the truth of dreams. The body and, physio <laughs> the body and physiology the starting point, why? We gain the correct idea of the nature of our subject unity, namely as regents at the head of a communality, not as souls or life forces. Also of the dependence of these regions upon the ruled and of an order of rank and division of labor as the conditions that make possible the whole and its parts. In the same way, how living unities continually arise and die, and how the subject is not eternal in the same way, that the struggle expresses itself in obeying and commanding, and that a fluctuating assessment of the limits of power is part of life. The relative ignorance in which the region is kept concerning individual activities and even disturbances within the communality is among the conditions under which rule can be exercised. In short, we also gain evaluation of not knowing, of seeing things on a broad scale, of simplification and falsification, of perspectivity.
The most important thing, however, is that we understand that the ruler and his subjects are of the same kind, all feeling, willing, thinking, and that wherever we see or divine movement in a body, we learn to conclude that there is a subjective, invisible life appertaining to it. Movement is symbolism for the eye. It indicates that something has been felt, willed, thought. The danger of the direct questioning of the subject about the subject and of all self-reflection of the spirit lies in this, that it could be useful and important for one's activity to interpret oneself falsely. That is why we question the body and reject the evidence of the sharpened senses. We try, if you like, to see whether the inferior parts themselves cannot enter into communication with us. Damn. Part 4. Biology of the Drive to Knowledge. Perspectivism. Hold on, well, I switch to paper format because I have printed out this part. Finally. How are y'all doing? Are you getting deep? Are you feeling deep? I hope you're stretching and opening your third eye, aka your butthole. Relax that butthole. Doesn't nature rule? Your dick is massive. Your dick is long. My dick is huge. Almost done, guys. Stick with it. And make sure you come to book club Sunday to discuss this text and gain access to all our other wonderful activities like daily yoga and Thomas the Tank Engine viewings. <laughs> Oops! <laughs> it's a sign we must continue. Part 4. Biology of the Drive to Knowledge. Perspectivism. Truth is the kind of error without which a certain species of life could not live. The value for life is ultimately decisive. It is improbable that our knowledge should extend further than is strictly necessary for the preservation of life. Morphology shows us how the senses and the nerves, as well as the brain, develop in proportion to the difficulty of finding nourishment. If the morality of thou shall not lie is rejected, the sense for truth will have to legitimize itself before another tribunal as a means of the preservation of man as will to power. Likewise, our love of the beautiful, it also is our shaping will. The two senses stand side by side. The sense for the real is the means of acquiring the power to shape things according to our wish. The joy in shaping and reshaping, a primeval joy. We can comprehend only a world that we ourselves have made. Oh my God, I love it, I fucking love it. of the multifariousness of language, of knowledge, oh my goodness, of the multifariousness of knowledge. To trace one's own relationship to many other things or the relationship of kind, how should that be knowledge of other things? The way of knowing and of knowledge is itself already part of the conditions and essential to us 
and to the entire organic process. Therefore, not all perceptions in general, e.g. not the electric. This means we have senses for only a selection of perceptions, those with which we have to concern ourselves in order to preserve ourselves. Consciousness is present only to the extent that consciousness is useful. It cannot be doubted that all sense perceptions are permeated with value judgments, useful and harmful, consequently pleasant or unpleasant. Each individual color is also for us an expression of value, although we seldom admit it or do so only after a protracted impression of exclusively the same color, e.g. a prisoner in prison or a lunatic. Thus insects also react differently to different colors, some like this color and some that, e.g. ants. I don't know what colors ants be liking, but that's interesting. Thank you, Nietzsche. First, images. To explain how images arise in the spirit, then words applied to images. Finally, concepts, possible only when there are words, the collecting together of many images in something non-visible but audible, word. The tiny amount of emotion to which the word gives rise as we contemplate similar images for which one word exists. This weak emotion is the common element, the basis of the concept. That weak sensations are regarded as alike, see, sensed as being the same, is the fundamental fact. Thus confusion of two sensations that are close neighbors, as we take note of these sensations, but who is taking note? Believing is the primal beginning, even in every sense impression, a kind of affirmation, the first intellectual activity a holding true in the beginning. Therefore, it is to be explained how holding true arose, what sensation lies behind true. The valuation, I believe that this and that is so, as the essence of truth. Invaluations are express conditions of preservation and growth. All our organs of knowledge and our senses are developed only with regard to conditions of preservation and growth. Trust in reason and its categories, in dialectic, therefore the valuation of logic proves only their usefulness for life proved by experience, not that something is true, Amen. that a great deal of belief must be present, that judgments may be ventured, that doubt concerning all essential values is lacking, that is the precondition of every living thing and its life. Therefore, what is needed is that something must be held to be true, not that something is true. The real and the apparent world, I have traced this antithesis back to value relations. We have projected the conditions of our preservation as predicates of being in general. Because we have to be stable in our beliefs if we are to prosper, we have made the real world a world not of change and becoming, but one of being. Section number five, origin of reason and logic. Originally a chaos of ideas. The ideas that were consistent with one another remained the greater number perished and are perishing. The earthly kingdom of desires out of which logic grew, the herd instinct 
in the background. The assumption of similar cases presupposes similar souls for the purpose of mutual agreement and dominion. On the origin of logic, the fundamental inclination to posit as equal, to see things as equal, is modified, held in check by consideration of usefulness and harmfulness by considerations of success. It adapts itself to a milder degree in which it can be satisfied without at the same time denying and endangering life. This whole process corresponds exactly to that external mechanical process, which is its symbol, by which protoplasm makes what it approaches equal to itself and fits it into its own forms and files. Equality and Similarity Number 1 the coarser organ sees much apparent equality. Item two, the spirit wants equality, i.e. to subsume a sense impression into an existing series in the same way as the body assimilates inorganic matter toward an understanding of logic. The will to equality is the will to power. The belief that something is thus and thus, the essence of judgment, is the consequence of a will that as much as possible shall be equal. <sighs> Logic is bound to the condition. Assume there are identical cases. In fact, to make possible logical thinking and inferences, this condition must first be treated fictitiously as fulfilled. That is, the will to logical truth can be carried through only a fundamental falsification of all events is assumed, from which it follows that a drive rules here that is capable of employing both means, firstly falsification, then the implementation of its own point of view. Logic does not spring from will to truth. Ooh, he did not. The inventive force that invented categories labored in the service of our needs, namely of our need for security, for quick understanding on the basis of signs and sounds, for means of abbreviation, substance, subject object, being, becoming, had nothing to do with metaphysical truths. It is the powerful who made the names of things into law, and among the powerful it is the greatest artists in abstraction who created the categories. Like you. <laughs> A morality, a mode of living tried and proved by long experience and testing, at length enters consciousness as a law, as dominating, and therewith the entire group of related values and states enters into it. It becomes venerable, unassailable, holy, true. It is part of its development that its origin should be forgotten. That is a sign it has become master. Exactly the same thing could have happened with the categories of reason. They could have prevailed after much groping and fumbling through their relative utility. There came a point when one collected them together, raised them to consciousness as a whole, and when one commanded them, i.e. when they had the effect of a command. From then on, they counted as a priori, as beyond experience, as irrefutable. And yet, perhaps, they represent nothing more than the expediency of a certain race and species. Their utility alone is their truth. Not to know, but to schematize, to impose upon chaos as much regularity and form as our practical needs require. 
in the formation of reason, logic, the categories. It was need that was authoritative. The need not to know, but to subsume, to schematize for the purpose of intelligibility and calculation. The development of reason is adjustment, invention, with the aim of making similar, equal, the same process that every sense impression goes through. No pre-existing idea was here at work. But the utilitarian fact that only when we see things coarsely and made equal do they become calculable and usable to us. Finality in reason is an effect, not a cause. Life miscarries with any other kind of reason, to which there is a continual impulse. It becomes difficult to survey, too unequal. The categories are truths only in the sense that they are conditions of life for us. As Euclidean space is a conditional truth between ourselves, since no one would maintain that there is any necessity for men to exist, reason, as well as Euclidean space, is a mere idiosyncrasy of a certain species of animal and one among many. The subjective compulsion not to contradict here is a biological compulsion. The instinct for the utility of inferring as we do infer is part of us. We almost are this instinct. But what naivety to extract from this a proof that we are therewith in possession of a truth in itself? Not being able to contradict is proof of an incapacity. Not of truth. Oh my god, shots fucking fired, Nietzsche. Damn. Why you gotta make me think about that like that? Why is it gotta be like that? Damn. Damn. Whew. We are unable to affirm and to deny one and the same thing. This is a subjective empirical law. Not the expression of any necessity, but only of an inability. Damn, it be like that. If, according to Aristotle, the law of contradiction is the most certain of all principles, if it is the ultimate and most basic upon which every demonstrative proof rests, if the principle of every axiom lies in it, then one should consider all the more rigorously what, presupp what presuppositions already lie at the bottom of it. Either it asserts something about actuality, about being, as if one already knew this from another source, that is, as if opposite attributes could not be ascribed to it. Or the proposition means, opposite attributes should not be ascribed to it. In that case, logic would be an imperative, not to know the true, but to posit and arrange a world that should be called true by us. In short, the question remains open. Are the axioms of logic adequate to reality, or are they a means and measure for us to create reality, the concept reality, for ourselves? To affirm the former one would, as already said, have to have a previous knowledge of being, which is certainly not the case. The proposition therefore contains no criterion of truth, but an imperative concerning that which should count as true. Supposing there were no self-identical A, such as is presupposed by every proposition of logic and of mathematics, and the A were already mere appearance, then logic would have a merely apparent world as its condition. In fact, we believe in this proposition under the influence of ceaseless experience which seems continually to confirm it, the thing that is the real substratum of A. A. Our belief in things is the precondition of our belief in logic. The A of logic is, like the atom, a reconstruction of the thing. 
if we do not grasp this but make of logic a criterion of true being, we are on the way to positing as realities all those hypostases, substance, attribute, object, subject, action, etc. That is, to conceiving a metaphysical world that is a real world. This, however, is the apparent world once more. It's like a prison. The very first acts of thought, affirmation, and denial, holding true and holding not true, are, inasmuch as they presuppose not only the habit of holding things true and holding them not true, but a right to do this, already dominated by the belief that we can gain possession of knowledge, that judgments really can hit upon the truth. In short, logic does not doubt its ability to assert something about the true in itself, namely, that it cannot have opposite attributes. Here reigns the coarse sensualistic prejudice that sensations teach us truths about things. That I cannot say at the same time of one and the same thing, that it is hard and that it is soft. The instinctive proof I cannot have two opposite sensations at the same time quite coarse and false. Ooh. The conceptual ban on contradiction proceeds from the belief that we are able to form concepts, that the concept not only designates the essence of a thing that comprehends it. In fact, logic, like geometry and arithmetic, applies only to fictitious entities that we have created. Logic is the attempt to comprehend the actual world by means of a scheme of being posited by ourselves, more correctly, to make it formulatable and calculatable, calculable for us. Oof. God, it hurts. It fucking hurts. I can't take it. In order to think and infer, it is necessary to assume beings. Logic handles only formulas for what remains the same. That is, why this assumption would not be proof of reality. Beings are part of our perspective. The ego as a being, not affected by becoming and development. The fictitious world of subject, substance, reason, etc. is needed. There is in us a power to order, simplify, falsify, artificially distinguish. Truth is the will to be master over the multiplicity of sensations. BAM, bitch! Put it on a coffee mug. Yes. Let me read that one more time. That is deep as fuck. I hope you're all on drugs. Let me read that one more time. One more time. <clears throat> I lost, I lost it. I got too excited. Fuck. Truth is the will to be master over the multiplicity of sensations. To classify phenomena into definite categories. In this, we start from a belief in the in itself of things. We take phenomena as real. The character of the world in a state of becoming an incapable of formulations. Oh, oh, sorry. The character of the world in a state of becoming as incapable of formulation, as false, as self contradictory. Knowledge and becoming exclude one another. Consequently, knowledge must be something else. There must first of all be a will to make knowable. A kind of becoming must itself create the deception of beings. I'm almost done, I promise. Stick with it. If our ego is for us the sole being, after the model of which we fashion and understand all being, very well. Then there would be very much room to doubt whether what we have here is not a perspective illusion, an apparent unity that encloses everything like a horizon. The evidence of the body reveals a tremendous multiplicity. 
it is allowable for purposes of method to employ the more easily studied, richer phenomena as evidence for the understanding of the poorer. Finally, supposing everything is becoming, then knowledge is possible only on the basis of belief in being. If there is only one being, the ego, and all other being is fashioned after its model, if finally belief in the ego stands or falls with belief in logic, i.e. the metaphysical truth of the categories of reason, if on the other hand the ego proves to be something in a state of becoming, then continual transition forbids us to speak of individuals, etc. The number of beings is itself in flux. We would know nothing of time and motion if we did not, in a coarse fashion, believe we see what is at rest besides what is in motion. The same applies to cause and effect. And without the erroneous conception of empty space, we should certainly not have acquired the conception of space. The principle of identity has behind it the apparent fact of things that are the same. A world in a state of becoming could not, in a strict sense, be comprehended or known, only to the extent that the comprehending and knowing intellect encounters a coarse, already created world, fabricated out of mere appearances, but become firm to the extent that this kind of appearance has preserved life. Only to this extent is there anything like knowledge, i.e. a meaning of earlier and later errors by one another. On logical semblance, the concepts individual and species equally false and merely apparent. Species expresses only the fact that an abundance of similar creatures appear at the same time and that the tempo of their further growth and change is for a long time slowed down. So actual small continuations and increases are not very much noticed a phase of evolution in which the evolution is not visible, so an equilibrium seems to have been attained, making possible the false notion that a goal has been attained and that evolution has a goal. The form counts as something enduring and therefore more valuable, but the form has merely been invented by us. And however often the same form is attained, it does not mean that it is the same form. What appears is always something new, and it is only we who are always comparing, who include the new to the extent that it is similar to the old, in the unity of the form, as if a type should be attained and, as it were, was intended by and inherent in the process of formation. Form, species, law, idea, purpose, in all these cases the same error is made of giving a false reality to a fiction, as if events were in some way obedient to something. An artificial distinction is made in respect of events between that which acts and that toward which the act is directed. But this which and this toward are only posited in obedience to our metaphysical logical dogmatism. They are not facts. One should not understand this compulsion to construct concepts, species, forms, purposes, laws, a world of identical cases, as if they enabled us to fix the real world, but as a compulsion to arrange a world for ourselves in which our existence is made possible. We thereby create a world which is calculable, simplified, comprehensible, etc. for us. This same compulsion exists in the sense activities that support reason by simplification, coarsening, emphasizing, and elaborating upon which all recognition, all ability to make oneself intelligible rests. Our needs have made our senses so precise that the same apparent world always reappears and has thus acquired the semblance of reality. 
Our subjective compulsion to believe in logic only reveals that long before logic itself entered our consciousness, we did nothing but introduce its postulates into events. Now we discover them in events. We can no longer do otherwise and imagine that this compulsion guarantees something connected with truth. It is we who created the thing, the identical thing, subject, attribute, activity, object, substance, form, after we had long pursued the process of making identical, coarse, and simple. The world seems logical to us because we have made it logical. Can I get an amen? Ultimate solution. We believe in reason. This, however, is the philosophy of gray concepts. Language depends on the most naive prejudices. Now we read disharmonies and problems into things because we think only in the form of language and thus believe in the eternal truth of reason, e.g. subject, attribute, etc. We cease to think when we refuse to do so under the constraint of language. We barely reach the doubt that sees this limitation as a limitation. Rational thought is interpretation according to a scheme that we cannot throw off. A prison. Those are my words. Last section, consciousness. This one is very short. Don't leave or I'll kill you. And so will Nietzsche. If you have the will to power, you will have the will to power through these last two pages for the section called consciousness, the last section of this part. Nothing is more erroneous than to make of physical and physical phenomena the two faces, the two revelations of one and the same substance. Nothing is explained thereby. The concept substance is perfectly useless as an explanation consciousness in a subsidiary role, almost indifferent, superfluous, perhaps destined to vanish and give way to a perfect automatism. When we observe only the inner phenomena, we may be compared with the deaf and dumb who divine through movements of the lips the words they do not hear. From the phenomena of the inner sense, we conclude the existence of invisible and other phenomena that we would apprehend if our means of observation were adequate and that one calls the nerve current. We lack any sensitive organs for this inner world. So we sense a thousandfold complexity as a unity. So we introduce causation where any reason for notion and change remains invisible to us. The sequence of thoughts and feelings is only their becoming visible in consciousness. That this sequence has anything to do with a causal chain is completely unbelievable. Consciousness has never furnished us with an example of cause and effect. Ooh, take that, take that, you soul believers. The role of consciousness. It is essential that one should not make a mistake over the role of consciousness. It is our relation with the outer world that evolved it. On the other hand, the direction or protection and care and respect of the coordination of the bodily functions does not enter into consciousness any more than spiritual accumulation. That a higher court rules over these things cannot be doubted. A kind of directing committee on which the various chief desires make their votes and power felt. Pleasure, displeasure are hints from this fear. Also the act of will, also ideas. In sum up, that which becomes conscious is involved in causal relations which are entirely withheld from us. The sequence of thoughts, feelings, ideas, and consciousness does not signify that this sequence is a causal sequence, but apparently it is so to the highest degree. Upon this appearance, we have founded our whole idea of spirit, reason, logic, etc. None of these exist. 
They are fictitious syntheses and unities, and projected these into things and behind things. Usually, one takes consciousness itself as the general sensorium and supreme court. Nonetheless, it is only a means of communication. It is evolved through social intercourse and with a view to the interests of social intercourse. Intercourse here understood to include the influences of the outer world and the reactions they compel on our side, also our effect upon the outer world. It is not the directing agent, but an organ of the directing agent. My proposition compressed into a formula that smells of antiquity, Christianity, scholasticism, and other muskiness <laughs> in the concept God as spirit, God as perfection is negated. Where a certain unity obtains in the grouping of things, one has always posited spirit as the cause of this coordination for which notion there is no ground whatever. Why should the idea of a complex fact be one of the conditions of this fact? Or why should the notion of a complex fact have to precede it as its cause? We shall be on our guard against explaining purposiveness in terms of spirit. There is no ground whatever for ascribing to spirit the properties of organization and systematization systematizes god damn it systematization the nervous system has a much more extensive domain the world of consciousness is added to it consciousness plays no role in the total process of adaptation and systematization shots fired physiologists like philosophers believe that consciousness increases in value and proportion as it increases in clarity the clearest consciousness the most logical and coldest thinking is supposed to be of the first rank however by what measure is this value determined in regard to release of will the most superficial most simplified thinking is the most useful it could therefore etc because it leaves few motives over. Precision in action is antagonistic to far-seeing providentiality, the judgments of which are often uncertain. The latter is led by the deeper instinct. Principal error of psychologists. They regard the indistinct idea as a lower kind of idea than the distinct but that which removes itself from our consciousness and for that reason becomes obscure can on that account be perfectly clear in itself. Becoming obscure is a matter of perspective of consciousness. Tremendous blunders. One, the absurd overestimation of consciousness, the transformation of it into a unity, an entity, spirit, soul, something that feels, thinks, wills, Two, spirit as cause, especially wherever purposiveness, system, coordination appear. Three, consciousness as the highest achievable form, as the supreme kind of being, as God. Four, will introduced wherever there are effects. Five, the real world as a spiritual world, as accessible through the facts of consciousness. 6. Knowledge as uniquely the faculty of consciousness wherever there is knowledge at all. Consequences. This is the last paragraph. Every advance lies in an advance in becoming conscious. Every regression in becoming unconscious. Becoming unconscious was considered a failing back to the desires and senses of, of i'm sorry becoming unconscious was considered a falling back to the desires and senses as becoming animal one approaches reality real being through dialectic one distances itself from it through the instincts senses mechanism to resolve man into spirit would mean to make him into God, spirit, will, goodness, all one. All good must proceed from spirituality, must be a fact of consciousness. Any advance toward the better 
can only be an advance in becoming conscious. The end. <laughs> Who of you is still with me? Who's high as fuck? Who has a giant dick? You are not a spirit. You are not a god. You are man. You were forged from the mud. And you were born to be great. I'll sit here with one cigarette and share some of my immediate thoughts. And then I will leave. And we will have the rest of the discussion Sunday evening in book club. If any of you are listening, by the way, please give me a thumbs up. Because that'd be so fucking nice. You can also give me money. Throw me a super chat for all that reading. Look, look how much reading I just did. I'm so fucking nice. What'd you guys think about this text? Have any deep thoughts? I know one of you might be on acid. I can't tell. I'm not sure if that happened. Woo! Nothing too deep because like I said, if you pay a dollar and come to book club Sunday, then you can talk with us for hours and hours about this in the voice chat. Uh, everybody who's a member can mic up and we all talk like we were all on the phone. You can do it on the phone, by the way, if you want. Um, that's how most people do it on the phone but you know reading this is really fun i think um nietzsche's perspectivism i think is not talked about often enough by the general public you know most people's familiarity god damn it these fucking three familiarity familiarity what is that six syllables there's a lot of six syllable world words tonight fucking me up. Purposiveness, pur purpose of it, no. Doesn't matter. Um, the familiarity a lot of individuals have with Nietzsche um, is kind of of him just as this like, almost like intellectual tyrant, joyful, yet stern. I mean, he is this. Uh, but I feel like a lot of his fanboys are, you know, people who are, like, uh, more conservative thinkers, which is really unfortunate. I mean, it's no secret that um, uh, the Nazis took his text. I believe it was actually this text. This is the text that they kind of moved a lot of shit around. Because if you were reading the text with me, you can see a lot of what I read uh, is very short paragraphs taken from different dates and rearranged and put together so it's easy to make things take on some sort of an order that could serve whatever purpose you want um sorry i'm trying to read what you're saying bungle bumbo whatever <laughs> if you're in the club already is that you tomboy if that's you just just type them in the chat. I'll be there in a second. In the Discord, where all the secret club members get to go hang out all fucking night together. Uh, but just to share my thoughts, what was I saying? Oh yeah, a lot of Nietzsche's fans are like, you know, more conservative thinkers and stuff. And these are the same kind of people that are always railing against postmodernism. And like I said in the beginning of this reading, though I'm sure not many of you stuck with it the whole way but um Nietzsche is essentially the forefather of postmodernism um for reasons that I think anybody who just listened to this text uh are now aware of <laughs> he's very much um taken with his feelings that knowledge is not some absolute thing. There is no substratum, no truth to find that underlies any sort of logical process, you know. All logic and all knowledge is our creation. And I think, I mean, there's a lot of powerful parts of this text, but the, ones, the one that really sticks with me is how he says that ultimately... 
uh, the fact that two opposing statements cannot be true shouldn't be seen as um, some sort of process that takes us forward into anything. If anything, it reveals an inadequacy of human logic, and it made me think of the Hegel reading again. And I, I don't know what Nietzsche's thoughts on Hegel was. I would love to find out. But he speaks, too, of this dialectic. And it's very frustrating because it's like, damn. The point just keeps getting hammered home by all the uh, philosophers that had anything interesting to say. That essentially, uh, logic might be might have more shortcomings than we originally realized, and even that we may realize when we sit and say things like, "All logic is created, all meaning is created, everything is an interpretation of our external reality." Like, yeah, we knew that. But I think the difficulty and, and the more novel ideas to arise from this kind of understanding is a recognition of just how incredibly fucking complex it will be for us, the philosophers and the phenomenologists, to actually advance into something useful and practical. Like Nietzsche seems to think the very purpose of logic and of reason is to be practical to make the world into something we can comprehend because the world is something much more complex than our systems of grammar and logic allow us to really comprehend you know but we have to basically create an interface which we do with logic and reason and language so that we can make sense out of the word world <laughs> the word world shout out to gene ray time cube is the greatest all clock faces are wrong Um, but part of why I think Nietzsche is so beautiful and resonates with so many people across the spectrum of thought, uh, even though, you know, there's a lot of sinister reasons I think that underlies this reality, some of his fan base on the right in particular, but, you know, um, he ultimately, I think, has a message of doing, the will to power, um... He believes that we as humans have a natural impulse to essentially overcome our surroundings. And this is not unique to humans as a species. This is something that really is kind of a property of the quality of everything, you know, even even these sort of nebulous cellular processes we observe in our natural sciences. <laughs> and shit you know um i like what he said near the end <clears throat> about how this belief that we that consciousness as we have come to interpret it uh reveals any sort of unity any sort of substratum of there being underlying truths of anything or even just creating these sort of hierarchies of thought itself with our institutions of psychiatry and psychology, that is to do humanity itself a disservice and to spiritualize our own understanding of ourselves in a way that is really detrimental to us and to this process that we are embarked on, religious or not, of willing truths into existence. So, <clears throat> I love that. Nietzsche, Nietzsche out here taking us to church. I see in the chat some people have a lot of thoughts and are going to go share them with me in the Discord. I'm going to go pop in there. Can't wait to read them. Also, Wiley says they'll have to reread this. <coughs> Excuse me. Before book club meeting on Sunday. Yeah, do it. Do it up. I've been having printer problems, so I've been uh, downloading PDFs and using the highlight tool. Anyone who needs to do that, do that. Rereading is really good. I think uh, I reread a lot of philosophy. I have to. Especially, you know, like this. I promise not to talk to myself or reread things so that it'd be more easy to listen to. But usually when I read, I have to reread paragraphs as I read them. 
and make notes right in the margins, draw lines, draw crazy shit, take breaks. It's hard shit. But anyway, I hope you uh, had a fun time. I'll be back soon for some talk about a podcast. Uh, Sunday, please come to the book club. It's only $1, like I said. Join via the website, www.phenomenology.club. Please give me a thumbs up on this upload. And um, also, I hope you're all safe and healthy during quarantine. Like I've also said, we have daily quarantine activities, including yoga (laughs) and shredding with Jillian Michaels. Dungeons and Dragons, we're also starting Spanish classes. We were supposed to start Wednesday, but I didn't get it together in time. My bad, sorry. But we got a lot going on, so just get your ass in there. It's only one fucking dollar. Anyway, have a great Friday evening, the rest of it, whatever you're doing, and I'll talk to you all later. And stay trippy off that 396 hertz.